This is World Civilization. My name is Dr. Long. This video is entitled the, the, the Three World Model. Since the 1950s, scholars as well as many in the media have used terms such as First World, Second World, and Third World to categorize all countries on Earth by their level of economic development. This way of looking at the world is called the Three World Model. French demogra demographer Alfred Sauvé originally came up with this model in 1952, basing it loosely on the three estates of French society prior to the French Revolution. Sauvé's use of this term, uh, of the, the, the term the third world, was in reference to France's third estate, which was composed of commoners. And he especially had the poor in mind in using the term the third world, again, compared to the third estate in the French, during the French Revolution. Now, during the Cold War, the third world model became especially popular, although it's sometimes still been used after the Cold War as well. In the three world model, countries that belong to the first world are wealthy, industrialized countries. Most of them are in the West, and this includes nations of Western Europe, the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, and more recently South Korea as well. Now, first world nations are industrialized and wealthy. They are typically democracies that protect civil liberties. And in addition, peoples in first world nations have access to modern transportation, communication, education, health care, and government welfare systems. They are also very well fed. All of these things ensure that peoples in first world nations have, a high, have the highest standards of living in, in the world. During the Cold War, the term Second World was often used to refer to communist nations such as the Soviet Union and the nations of Eastern Europe, nations that were rivals to the capitalist and democratic nations of the First World, such as the United States and the nations of Western Europe. Second World nations were industrialized, and their citizens had access to adequate medicine, education, and some social welfare benefits. However, Second World nations were not democratic and thus not as free as nations of, of, of the first world. Moreover, living standards in second world nations were not as high as in first world nations, and particularly second world nations were often lacking in consumer goods. Second world nations, again, primarily communist nations, uh, were known for their lack of consumer goods and lack of choice overall. Now, after the fall of communism and the end of the Cold War in 1990 and 1991, Former communist nations have seen some improvements, yet they still have many issues in their political system, such as corruption, and still often struggle economically. And sometimes the, world, the, the term second world is still, still applied to former communist nations, such as Russia, the Ukraine, and the nations of Eastern Europe. Now during the Cold War, all nations that were either not part of the first or, 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 or second world were classified as third world nations. Many third world nations after the Second World War, especially in Africa and Asia, had recently become independent of European colonial rule. Now some of these nations in the 1950s and 1960s were part of what, it, what, what, was been, what had been called the non-alignment movement. The non-alignment movement was an international movement during the Cold War that attempted to take a neutral approach to, towards the Cold War neither siding on the one hand with the United States nor on the other hand with the Soviet Union. The five countries that played a key role in the beginning of the non-alignment movement were India, Indonesia, Egypt, Yugoslavia, and Ghana. Thus, the third world was often associated with a third way, a non-aligned way between the United States, capitalism and democracy, and the Soviet Union and communism, and taking a neither one nor the other approach a third way. Nonetheless, what third world nations were particularly known for and what they had in, often had in common was not necessarily their political commitment, such as non-alignment, but their level of economic development. Economically, third world nations were and are today considered impoverished. They are not fully industrialized, although they have attracted some low-level, low-wage industries such as textiles. Most clothing today, for instance, is made in, made in third world nations, 
You know, look at the labels on some of your own clothing, and you, and you can see this. To use Emanuel Wallerstein's uh, uh, terminology, third world nations are the periphery of the world economy, the world system, while first world nations are the core of the world system, the world economy. This means that third world nations are economically dependent on the first world. They are often heavily indebted to first world nations in the financial system. In terms of production, third world nations either produce low, uh, low level industrial goods or especially produce agricultural goods and raw materials for the markets of the first world. So the, the, the economies of the third world are typically geared towards the market of the first world. Third world nations often have corrupt, undemocratic governments, and they suffer from violence, uh, for instance, street gangs in countries such as El Salvador or Brazil. And socially, third world nations have a great deal of inequality. They have bad infrastructure, schooling, and medicine. And many people in third world nations are malnourished and like, lack decent housing. Third world nations also have sanitation problems and struggle to provide their citizens even with clean drinking water in some cases. Now while the third, third world model is useful to an extent, for instance in describing material standards of living in different nations, it has been criticized on several counts. First, many first world nations have deep pockets of poverty in both rural and urban areas. So if you live in a first world nation, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a high standard of living. Again, there's, there are deep pockets of poverty in rural and urban areas in first world nations. Many people who struggle economically in first world nations hardly feel that they are part of the economic core of the global economy. In fact, many people who struggle economically in places such as the United States and uh, Western Europe feel left out or even uh, culturally or economically threatened by the forces of globalization and immigration. And we've seen that uh, in the last uh, decade or so. Now conversely, some third world nations have significant populations of very wealthy people. You know, so this is kind of the other way around, right? There are first world nations with, with strong pockets of poverty. There are third world nations with, with large pockets of wealthy people. A good example of this is Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is often technically classified as a third world nation, but it has a considerable number of people who are very wealthy and live quite well due to its oil wealth. So in this respect, the third world model is a bit simplistic and does not accurately describe the economies and the status of many individuals who live with, within them. A second cri uh, criticism of the third world model is that by focusing on things such as economics and GDP, it tends to reinforce Eurocentrism and the overall notion that the Western world is superior to non-Western nations. In addition, it tends to equate material life with success and happiness. But this is not always the case. To give one example, nations typically described as first world nations often have high rates of illicit drug use, obesity, and depression, indicating that many people in first world nations are not necessarily happy in spite of their material success. Now while few would argue that grinding poverty is a good thing, poverty does not always equate to unhappiness and wealth does not always equate to happiness. A final criticism of the third world model is that it is, that it is obsolete as it dates back to the Cold War. And many things have changed since the end of the Cold War. Many nations that have been labeled third world have seen strong economic growth and are better described as developing nations. A good example of this is China. China was an extremely poor nation in the 1960s and 1970s. But since uh, the, uh, the, the rule of Deng Xiaoping, who came to uh, rule China in the late 1970s, China has come to focus on economic growth. And this has tremendously changed China. In fact, since 1990, when China came to embrace a more capitalist system, and to pursue global trade and economic growth, China has come to lift 800 million people out of poverty. And this is the greatest shift out of poverty in the history of the world. So the economic growth that China has experienced has been so rapid and so profound and so transformative that one can question, is China a third world nation anymore? 
Uh, that's a questionable notion. World Bank President uh, 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 Jim Young Kim has called the rise of China and, it, the, and the number of people that it's lifted out of poverty as a result as one of the greatest, greatest stories in human history. You know, so what has happened in China has been incredibly important and incredibly profound. Now likewise, economic growth has lifted many millions of people out of poverty in India. Uh, and India has, has grown to such an extent now that hunger is no longer a major problem. So in the end, the, third, the, the three world model is still useful to a degree. However, we should be aware of its flaws and its limitations. So I'll stop with that observation. Thanks for watching.